Hi friends, welcome back to the channel. In my last video, I explained how CSRF attack works, but I think my explanation wasn't good enough. That's why today I'm going to do something different. I'm not going to be a developer and instead I'll be putting on my hacker hoodie and demonstrating a CSRF attack on a banking website. We will look at how creating this attack was even possible in the first place and then reveal the top strategies to prevent it. But before I dive into the video, we need to get this disclaimer out of the way. This video is for educational purposes only. Any hacking or penetration testing without prior approval is illegal. So let's learn and have some fun without breaking any laws. Wait, but how are you going to hack a banking website without breaking any laws? Well, that's why I created a fake banking website using Spring, the one we can practice on. You can run it using the Docker container or clone the GitHub repository. For both, I provided link and instructions in the description down below. It's easier to get up and running using Docker as it's just one command. But if you want to learn how to protect your website against CSRF attacks, it's something that we're going to do in the next part of the video, it's better to clone GitHub repository and run the project in your favorite IDE. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to open this project in my IDE, run it and walk you through its features. As you can see, this project is currently opened in IntelliJ IDE. So if I'm going to run it, and then navigate to my browser. Then I'm going to type the URL, which is localhost 8080, where I will be welcomed by a login screen. To make sure that our hard earned money is well protected, I set the default username as banker and the secure password money123. So if I'm going to type those, our banking website would be opened. A couple of things to note here. At the top, we have our current balance, at the bottom, under the recent bank transactions section, we have our recent transactions. And I already populated it with an example that we sent our buddy a hundred bucks for a dining out. But in the middle of the page, we have a transfer money form. It has the following fields, the account that we are going to transfer to, the note or the transfer and the amount. I already populated those fields so it's easier and I don't have to type it here. That form is actually an HTML form that is going to send a post request to our banking server. So if I go into click a confirm transfer, as we can see, as a result, there is a transfer successful confirmation of our transfer. Our current balance was reduced by $50. And we also see our recent transaction to utility management company, $50 for a water bill. We can also navigate to our homepage and see exact same page that we had before, but with the, the most recent transaction that we just did. Now, here's the interesting part. Remember, I said this website was vulnerable to CSRF attack. I want you to try to implement an exploit that will steal all the money from this bank account. There is actually no limit. You can go into a negative balance. Okay, here are the three hints that will help you do this. First is to make sure to inspect the source code of the web page and see which URL is used to send a form post request. The second tip is to remember that you can create your own HTML on your local machine. And the third tip is to keep in mind that most of the time browsers send all cookies by default. Now I will pause the video, we'll let you try to come up with your own solution and you can resume when you're ready. We'll solve it together. Were you able to figure this out? If yes, you can check out my solution, but if not, let's do it together. So looking at my previous hints, what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to this web page and open my inspector window in Chrome. What I'm going to do right now is to look at this web page and I can see that there is a form right here. This form is actually responsible for sending a request to the server, which in fact is going to send a financial transaction. There is also a URL, which is pointed right here. It's called slash transfer. However, this is a relative URL, which is going to be appended to base URL of the website, uh, which we can see over here. Since we're going to send this form from a malicious website, we need to specify the full URL of the actual banking website in this form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this form right here in the browser, then I will copy it and we'll follow from there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say HTTP local host 8080. That would point to our legitimate banking website. What I'm also going to do, so to differentiate this transaction, is I'm going to change the value to from utility management company to let's say hackers account. I'm also going to change the note from water bill to let's say stolen. And 
I'm going to change the value from 50 to let's say 950. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to edit HTML and copy this entire form. Then I'm going to go to my terminal and create NCD into the folder called malicious form. Then I'm going to create a file index.html and paste our form right here. So to make it a little bit better, I will open in Visual Studio Code and I'm going to wrap this into HTML tags. I'm going to save this. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to back to my IntelliJ IDE. I'm going to restart my legitimate server which starts on port 8080. And then I'm going to navigate to my folder which contains malicious form and I will start another HTTP server which starts on port 8081. I'm going to navigate to my Chrome browser and log in to my bank account. When you get to our bank account, I can do the transfer, return to the homepage, so everything works as expected. We have $950 left after transferring $50 to the water bill. But now I'm going to open our malicious form 127.0.0. Let me change that. Uh, 0.0.1 at the port 881. And I will click confirm transfer from here. Boom. We see that the transfer was successful from a different website without the need to log in. We can see that the current balance is zero. We can see that the under recent bank transactions, we have a hacker account, uh, which is mentioned slotten, but it should be stolen. Anyway, there is a typo here. And then I'll go to the home page. Some of you might think that because we used localhost for the original website and the address of 127.0.0.1 for our malicious website, it can be treated as the same website. However, browser will still treat them differently. Again, because localhost is different from 127.0.0.1 and because those websites use the different ports. So the original one was using 8080, the malicious one was using 8081. It is still considered a valid scenario for the cross-site request forgery because again, those are the different URLs from the browser perspective. Let's dive a little bit deeper here and see what actually happened. So if I open my ID, if I go to my application and I will start again, and I will go back to my browser, refresh the page, log in with my account, and uh, I will clear the logs in the ID, and I will make a transfer, we can see that, we can see that the original website sent a cookie with J session ID equal to that string. So if I'm going to clear the logs right now, go back to my browser and open the malicious form, I will hit confirm transfer and go back to my IDE. We can see that the header cookie value J session ID was also sent from the form. That confirms that the browser will automatically send the cookie to the origin server. Now the question is, how can we protect against it? All right, we just uncovered how to play a role of cyber criminal. But now let's switch gears and become a guardian developer to protect our application. Spring Security actually recommends two ways of protecting your app against CSRF attacks. One of them being is same site attribute on a session cookie. And the second one is synchronizer token pattern, also known as CSRF token. We'll look at the same site attribute first and then look at the synchronizer token pattern. Before explaining how same site attribute cookie works, let me show you the cookie attributes in general so we can have a better idea what it means. If I'm going to restart my application and navigate to web browser and navigate to my banking website and open inspector, then I'll go to application tab and to uh, cookies menu item here. We can see that we have our JSON AD cookie with value as a random string, and there are several attributes on this cookie itself. So one of those is same site attribute. So what does this attribute do? Remember that CSRF attack was possible in the first place because our browser automatically sent cookie from a cross website 
to the original website. So what if it would be possible to send cookie only from the original website and none from the other websites? This is what controlled by the same site cookie attribute and it has three values. The first value is strict and if set, the browser will only send cookie from the original website. It's not going to send a cookie if it coming from any other website. The other value is lax. It's the same as strict, so it will send from the original website, but it will also send a cookie from the other website if it's a top navigation get request. Top navigation meaning that it is coming from a web browser. And the last value is none, meaning that a cookie will be sent as from original website as well as from any other website. This is least secure option. It was for the long time default in the browsers. However, starting from the couple of years ago from Chrome version 80, the default behavior of the browser is lax. However, you might have a question, how it was possible in the first place for us to perform such an attack if we were using the post request? Because I mentioned that the LAX will only allow to send a cookie from non-origin website using a top navigation get request. Actually, while preparing for this video, it took me a couple of hours to find why this behavior was allowed. The truth is the default behavior of the browser is LAX, but if I go to my website, there is no actual lax attribute set, which means it will behave like a lax, but there is a 120 second window, which allows for any other browser to send a cookie with a top navigation post request. It will not be allowed using a JavaScript, but it will be allowed using the same scenario as we just did. All right, if we go back to our application right here, I will show you what's going to happen if we're going to set same attribute cookie value to strict. And in order to do this in Spring, we need to navigate to application.properties, use the servlet session cookie same site property set to strict. If I restart my application right now and then navigate to my browser, that will ask me to log in again. I will use the username as bank here and password as money123. Uh, I will be able to log in and then in a separate tab, I will open my malicious website. Then I will clear the logs in my application and see what happens now. If I click confirm transfer, browser redirected us to a login page. Let's see what our Spring application tells us. If I go in to inspect my logs, I don't see cookie anywhere. So which means the browser didn't send our cookie and the same site attribute worked. If I also go to my original website, I will have to re-log in. I would say banker money one, two, three. And I will go to my console. I can see that same site right now is set to strict, uh, which means the protection worked well. It's worth to point out, even though this approach worked, it's still an emerging practice. There are still some older browsers which may not support same site cookie attribute and their default value would be set to none. However, when implemented, it does offer an additional layer of defense that can complement existing security features. However, the most popular and reliable way to protect against CSRF attacks is to use Synchronizer Token Pattern, also known as CSRF Token. CSRF Token is a fancy word for any random string that only our application knows about. But to understand why it's needed, let's reflect on the CSRF problem one more time. The CSRF attack is possible because the browser automatically sends cookie, in our case session ID, to the server. Because that's the only thing that tells the server that it's truly me, the user, Anyone who gets the session ID cookie can get access to my data. At this point, it doesn't matter how, either by stealing it or, like in our case, leveraging the browser's behavior. But what if session ID would not be the only thing that can verify our identity? What if we can have something else that is not automatically sent by the browser? That something else is the CSRF token. It can be any string that is generated by the server and returned back to the client. Usually, it happens during the very first request of the web page. Most of the time, it's embedded in HTML form as a hidden input field. Now, when we do a request, our application submits two values, CSRF token and session ID. In this case, even if the attacker would leverage the automatic send cookie behavior to the malicious web page, the server would still reject the request as it wouldn't find the second missing part, the CSRF token. The key takeaway here is that the CSRF token is not part of the cookie and it's not sent automatically by the browser, but rather controlled by our application logic. Let me show you how it works. If I go back to my application, I would, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to comment back our line. So the same site attribute will become to the browser's default. And also what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to our security config and I will comment this line which disables CSRF token. Actually a default security feature that comes in Spring, which I had to disable to make this demo work. So now if I'm going to turn it on back, I will restart my application 
I will navigate to the browser. I will re-log into my banking website and I'm going to inspect my form. I can see that now there is input of type hidden with some long and random string. That is actually a CSRF token. So if now, if I try to transfer money from my malicious website, uh, but before I do this, let me clear the logs first and go back here again. I will hit confirm transfer. We'll see an error page. But so what more interesting, if we go back to my logs, we can see that invalid CSRF token found for this website and it responds with 403, meaning that the malicious website didn't have the token that was generated by the original website. Therefore, the server was able to prevent this attack. Before ending this video, we need to talk about one important thing. Since we now understand how to perform a CSRF attack and how to protect against it, there is still one fact that is not clear, which is something that was mentioned by a person in my previous video, Virus A, is how the malicious website is making its way into the user's browser. At the end, there is almost zero chance that someone is going to click our ugly form that we used to exploit a banking website. Well, that form can be hidden in a more beautifully crafted website, such as fake e-commerce win million dollar website or website from that prince from Nigeria that don't have anyone to leave inheritance to. Usually those websites can be opened by people from web search results, clicking on a malicious link that was sent to your email or as a part of DNS spoofing attack. I wouldn't go into the details of how DNS spoofing attack works, but it's a type of attack where a hacker can change the DNS resolution process. So while resolving the name, based on AP address, user will be redirected to a malicious website instead of the original one. That'll be it for this video. And please let me know in the comments below whether you liked it and what type of content you wanna see in the future. I hope you learned something new. Please hit the subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one.